Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Okay, I'm going to call this meeting June 10th. 2024 meeting of the board of commissioners for uh, budget session work session to order um, we don't have the uh, invocation and the pledge on the agenda but i'm going to insert them anyway and i think i'm up in june so i will go ahead and open join me with a word of prayer Father God, as we come before you, dear Lord, deliberating the needs of our citizens in Alamance County, we ask you to be with us, to guide and direct our thoughts, our meditations, our words, dear Lord. Be respectful of the needs of our community and help us find solutions where they're needed. And we ask, dear Father, that you be with all of us, keep us strong, healthy, and alert. We ask you to be with our citizens, dear Lord. Keep our community safe. We ask all this, dear Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, Ms. York, I think you're up. I am up. I wanted to kind of kick off our second budget work session today. Um, I'm going to go through some of the items that we're going to talk about and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, we have some small adjustments that we need to make you aware of. We'll start with those um, before we really get into any of the substantive items. The board had some questions about fund balance, both what that was looking like in uh, the current year, as well as what we were projected to potentially use next year. So Susan is going to cover that. And then we had lots of questions exchanged with ABSS. So we have brought them here today to try to wrap up that piece so we can start finding our way to a place of making adjustments towards an adopted budget. Okay. So that's what we're... Um, scheduled to talk about and with that um, I think Rebecca our budget director can walk us through some of those uh, house cleaning items budgets change as we get further along and so we needed to bring some of those uh, to your attention can we sing the Abel Tuesday song make that just a little bit bigger so what Bruce has shown up on the screen um, is at this point in the budget cycle, we have a few staff recommendations for changes to the budget that happen naturally between the recommended and the adopted budget. And the first item that we have is we have uh, during this fiscal year noticed that fines and forfeitures revenue has come in above budget. That you may remember is by state statute a pass through funding source through the county to the schools. It can only be used for schools and um, for school technology mostly. So we are recommending that we increase both revenue and expenditure budget by 200,000. So that is currently budgeted at 800,000 for ABSS. This would take that to a million. That's our first staff recommendation. Our second would be the library department recently received notice of an award of $27,200 that will be effective July 1, and they receive that notification June 6. So we'd like to go ahead and amend um, the budget now as a part of the adopted, as opposed to bringing it back to you later. That would be also on the revenue and the expenditure side. So at the top of the screen, you'll see any changes to the revenue budget, and then at the bottom of the screen, you'll see any changes to the expenditure budget. And a little bit further down, we'll get to is there any surplus or gap. And so I'll go through any of our staff recommendations to the expenditure budget. 
and then we'll open it up in case any of the commissioners have any adjustments that they would like to propose and we can start documenting those. So from the expenditure side, you'll note that that first item would be to remove 325,000 from the ABSS capital funding for the bleacher repairs uh, during your May 30th work session, we voted to fund those repairs out of the current year budget. And so we are able then to remove 325,000 from the school's capital budget and then put that into the transfer for school's capital reserve. So just as a reminder, that has a $0 impact on our budget because those funds are part of our debt model where we flow through uh, directly to um, the school's capital reserve. Next, we noted that there was an economic development grant that was expiring. And so that is $30,000 that we are removing from the expenditure budget. Uh, that does help our budget a little bit. So it reduces our expenditures by 30,000. And then next, you'll see the expenditure side of that fines and forfeitures that I talked about before, the 200,000. Um, and then the 27,200 for the library expenditures for that grant that we are adding. So that takes our current budget now to 220, 220,729,852 with a surplus of 30,000. Are there any other adjustments that you'd like to add to this as we start reviewing? Okay. And we'll revisit again at the end of the meeting and of course uh, throughout the whole process, please email Heidi if you have any other suggested adjustments. Ms. Thompson, do you have anything you want to add? Or? Um, not with that, but I just wanted to ask a question, something sure. I worked really hard for last year with the three ball fields every mm -hmm. year and I'm assuming they have really been cut. So if you could just tell me what they were and what they've gone to, just, just to get that out there because I totally understand I understand the cuts. We got to be fair across the board. Yeah, thank you for asking about that one. We did want to draw your attention to that because that was something that was proposed in your capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. And then in the manager's recommended budget, we did adjust that. Do you have those amounts? I do. Um, and then if you'll give us just a sec, we'll put up on the screen. And there should be the, the last attachment to your packet. There should be a um, county capital page that will show what that updated list of county capital projects, including the adjustment to this athletic field's total amount. So you may remember from the CIP, the manager's recommended CIP, that the total county capital recommended amount was 2,830,000. And then during the manager's recommended operating operating budget, that amount decreased to $2.18 million. And the adjustment you can see from this page on the screen was that in an effort to balance the budget, we have recommended reducing the parks athletic fields upgrades from a million dollars per year to 350,000 for 24-25. So it will still happen, it's just gonna slow the process down. Uh, can, I, can I ask? Of course. Yeah. Mr. Baker. What does that buy, this new amount? What can that buy? Uh, that will probably be for the field lights at um, Altamaha Osby Elementary, and that's probably it. But that's one of the most expensive things uh, at a new field, or at renovating the field. I think it'll be about three, 300 for lights, so that's probably all we'll be able to get done. I think what we were thinking with this particular project was spreading it over two years, mm -hmm. so doing half in this fiscal year, half in next fiscal year, so just delaying the process. So the total amount would be 700000 And it, Brian, can you remind us what we spent on the current year field? It was not quite a million. No, it was, it was about seven fifty. I think it, so. We're trying to keep this one in a similar line with the other one. We're just delaying the progress on it by spreading it over two years. Okay. Can you tell me what B. Everett Jordan, what is done? Because I hadn't been down there in a month or so to take pictures. Because last time I was there, all the cement bleachers were gone. Yeah, and, I mean, it doesn't look like much right now. We've mostly well, take, taken out all the old stuff. So the shelter's gone, the old building's gone, the lights are gone, the bleachers are gone. All 
all that stuff's on order and it's all coming in. Um, just not quite there yet. So there will be a new building placed, a new shelter, and new lights in the next few months. Okay. Well, this is going to be the year of the bleachers. That's right. Okay. All right. I just wanted to know because, I mean, you know, people get their hopes up and we all, about all kind of stuff of improvement for families. And I just wanted to know the details. That's all. Thank you. And just to close the loop on where we can find that amount in your recommended operating budget, okay. if you turn to page 121 to the maintenance section, you'll see there's a table that shows our, and I do not have that up on the screen, um, but you'll see that the amount of capital projects that the maintenance department will project manage for 24-25 is that $2,180,000 amount from our updated sheet here. Mr. Chairman, a couple questions. Um, yes. Mr. Baker, if we if we don't complete um, the Everett Jordan this year, will we just roll the money into next year for that same project? Right. Yeah, that money will stay. It's already been encumbered, so we okay. will stay and get paid out of there. Okay. And, uh, Ms. Short, the, the 2.1, where does that come from? Is that general fund or is that capital reserve? This is general fund. Okay. The county pay-go portion is general fund. The plans are that Beaver Jordan will be done. Right. So because we reduced the scope of that, of the initial million dollar estimate, there's two fields there. We focused on just doing one field. So the second field is not going to be done now. Um, but that one field will be done by next baseball season, ideally in the fall. Um, and we'll move on to AO Elementary and eventually, hopefully, to EM Hold Elementary. And at the end, hopefully, we'll be able to come back and do that last deal to be ever joined. When are we going to begin the public defender renovation? <coughs> well, they have until the end of June to get out, and so not before that, but uh, pretty soon thereafter. Now how tight is that two feet? Beyond tight. I, yeah, I, that's. I, I don't. <coughs> think that, I'm not sure that's going to be enough, to be honest with you. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the day, at the dais who can make a comment like this, but it's tough to get a lawyers out of a place, right? <laughs> well, they don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Only a lawyer can say that. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody was thinking that. But that's what makes don't a good lawyer. Don't forget Baker's a lawyer. He's been in the closet with his lawyerness for a long time. He's a lawyer. Now, Mr. Porter, be careful what you say. Both those general lawyers. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Lash. I have some questions right now about this. Uh, okay. Get back to me. Yeah, I'm good as well. Any other questions, board? Thank you. Ms. Evans? question has been posed to county staff um, where we figure that fund balance will be please know that this is the disclaimer that these are all estimates the fiscal year is not complete and we will not have final numbers until the audit is completed historically uh, unassigned fund balance has been used and budgeted to balance the budget you can see from the diagram on the screen we've had anywhere from 6.6 .6 million to 6.1 million that's being used in 23-24. And that was just a budgetary balance to make sure that our revenues are equaling our expenses. For our audit financial statements for this period, for these periods, we have not actually had to dip into any of the fund balance savings. At all, ever? At all. Now, I'm not gonna say ever, but prior to 2018-19, no, sir. So our current projections, we're looking at revenues that are gonna be roughly around a 211.2 million expenditures of 207 million which would leave us with revenues exceeding expenses by 3.3 million dollars 
Now, what's not calculated in these revenues and expenses are our other financing sources, which will be the $10 million that will be transferred from the ARP fund to the general fund. If the board will remember that is for that revenue replacement. We have to have those funds spent by the end of December. So we want to go ahead and get those moved over into the general fund. That will give the commissioners more flexibility to do projects with that $10 million. But also what was not in there is the transfers out. So in the expenses, we do not have the $7.3 million that the board approved for us to transfer from general fund reserves to the county capital reserves. Uh, if the board will remember back uh, when we were dealing with the mold issue, there was an additional appropriation of $1.2 million to ABSS for additional capital projects for PAYGO. And then what's not also in here is the annual transfer we'll do at the very end of the year once all sales tax revenues have been received of $1.7 million. So when we take into account the pluses and the minuses of those transfers, that would be an estimated impact to fund, to fund balance of adding $2.9 million. So if we're looking at where would we stand as a percentage base, um, please remember this is all estimated. Our fund balance does not change until the close of the fiscal year. So according to our fiscal year 22-23 audit, the county had an unassigned fund balance of $46.7 million. Taking into account the transfer that the board approved of the $7.3 million, that brought us within the fund balance or within our fiscal policy to 20% fund balance of expenditures. When we take into consideration now the transfer to the school's capital project of $1.2 million, we would have a calculated fund balance as of right now without any additions to the fund balance of $38.1 million. So when we're looking at the calculation, it's a, it's a fluid percentage that's calculated because to get that, you take what your fund unassigned fund balance would be and divide it by your projected expenditures. Right now, that's projected to be about $207 million. So that would mean that our fund balance would dip slightly below our 20% policy to 18.3. Please remember, these are just estimates, and we won't have final until the audit is complete. So when we look at fund balance, one thing that we need to remember is that we haven't had to use fund balance to support our operations, but we've used it to balance our budget. And when we're looking at our sales tax collections for fiscal year 22-23, we had an overall budget of $43.2 million. These figures exclude any Medicaid held harmless funds. So this is just true articles of sales tax revenue that would be generated. Um, but we had a budget of $43.2 million. We received slightly below our budget, um, didn't meet budget by $164,000. So we did pretty good in fiscal year 22-23 of 99.62%. If the board will remember, one thing that the county started doing was raising the amount that we were budgeting in sales tax because as a safeguard, having a conservative sales tax budget allowed us to have that cushion not to use the fund balance that we were having to budget to balance the budget. Um, so within our fiscal year 22-23 budget, just to remind the board that just under $8.3 million of that sales tax revenue was restricted articles that could only be used for school. So in fiscal year 22-23, that top line that you see there, that straight across line, is if we were to take that $43.6 million and say, well, what would be a monthly budget? A monthly budget would equate to about $3.6 million. And you can see that six times in fiscal year 22-23 was the sales tax collection actually greater than the monthly budget. So there were evens and nods. So that shows where we really came in under budget by that 99.64%. Um, the other lines that you see there will show what our so the bars are our actual collections in that month and then the historical data for 2020 2021 and 2022 so while we are seeing sales tax growth we're also budgeting for that growth so in 23 24 in our current fiscal year we have actually received 10 months worth of revenue 
Um, we had a budget of $46.3 million. We've actually collected right now through the collections of this month of $37.1 million, which means that we need to receive $9.1 million so that we will meet our budget. And when we look at that same comparison of using a monthly budget, it equated to $3.8 million. And we've actually exceeded that budget by three months, in three months. So when we're looking at that solid line for our budget, you can see sales tax hasn't quite met that budget, monthly budgeted amount. Um, May and June you'll see are empty because those are for the sales that will be remitted to the state of North Carolina in May and June. So we'll actually collect those two months in July and August. But those will be accrued back to this fiscal year. So in conclusion of this part, for fiscal year 23, I'm sorry, for 24, 25, right now we are budgeted for unassigned fund balance to be used of $7.4 million. Sales tax revenue, um, like I said earlier, has been used to offset that amount that was being used there. Um, so what this tells the board is that if revenues come in exactly as they are projected, and if revenue and if expenses are spent to every penny, that the county would use $7.4 million of fund balance for fiscal year 24-25. Sales tax is one is the second largest revenue source for the county, coming making up about 21.6% of our annual budget for fiscal year 23-24. And please remember, those were estimates as far as fund balance and where we would be, but that is the best guess that I've got right now. Are there any questions? Mr. Turner. Uh, Ms. Evans, can you go back to page two? Page, which page? Two. two. Yes, sir. All right. Um, so each of the years from 18 to 23, we have never dipped into the budgeted amount of unassigned fund balance. That's correct. 23-24, we, we've got budgeted 6.2 essentially. Mm -hmm. That equates to the 7.4 that you're- That's earning. correct. Okay, so what amount do you project, if any, that we're gonna go into that 6.2 this year? So I'm not projecting that we're gonna go into that amount. Right now I'm projecting that we would have about a $2.9 million swing um, bet between, between revenues and expenses. So right now, if revenues came in where I'm projecting and expenses are the same amounts as fiscal year 22, 23, then based on those estimates, we would add $2.9 million to fund balance. Okay. So we, we, based on your projections, we won't dip into it this year. That's yet. correct. But the 10, you have to use the $10 million in ARPA revenue replacement in order to do that? Yes. Weren't we using the $10 million in our replacement and keeping that in our pocket for some capital improvement? So this will be in the pocket. This is just uh, showing, this is the net effect to the general fund. At the end of the fiscal year, when you have your revenues, your expenses, and then looking at the revenues that are coming in from other funds, as well as the revenues that are going out from the general fund to the other funds, your net impact to general fund is going to be $2.9 million. Positive. Positive. That's correct. All right. The 7.4 I get, that's money we're going to, that we've already voted to put into the capital reserve for the county. Mm -hmm. The school capital project of 1.2, what is that? So that was once, remember, uh, ABSS had to use $2.1 million right. of PAYGO funding right. for mold remediation. They already had the $1.2 million that was already in contracts. Right. So the board took action to approve 1.2 being sent to the school's capital project fund. Current projections. Why is that already gone out? So that has already gone out. That 1.2 million. Okay. The part that has not gone out is that 1.7 million, which would go to the school's capital reserve, and that yeah. will be done once we've collected all sales tax. And that's in September. That would be in September. So why is that a hit to this year if we would transfer it out in September? Because it is an accrual back into this fiscal year. Bottom line is, we're not going to dip into fund balance this year, you project, if things stay the same for the next two months. Mm -hmm. and we still have the $10 million in ARPA funds that we can use for capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yes. 
It's not as dire as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and that $10 million has to be spent by December of 25? So now that we have moved this funding over into the general fund, that takes that removes that time limit okay. because it's already been accounted for in the ARPA fund. So it takes that pressure off and the board can okay. decide how to use it in the future. We'd be in a, quite a situation if we didn't have good old ARPA funds, wouldn't we? Ms. Thompson, your turn. Sorry, I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lashley. Um, Ms. Evans, I just want to um, go to page 8. Um, we're 80% of budget. That's correct. If you look at, just make some, um, I mean, I was very surprised that April came in as strong as it was, around mm -hmm. $4 million. Um, I don't think that May is going to be as strong. I guess what I'm looking at is no matter what we do or don't do here, it looks like we're going to be $2 million, two to two and a half million dollars underwater when this fiscal year is up. So the reason I even bring that to your attention is because that's about how much is going into the fund balance. I think it's all going to be a wash. So that's looking at one revenue source line. Um, when I'm projecting the revenues over the expenses, that's looking at the county as a whole. Um, but yes, having the $2.5 million, roughly about $2 million that would be below our budget receiving, it's going to have an impact. Yeah. Um, so where we've got other revenues that are coming in or expenses that we haven't paid out this year, that's where your true offset is coming in. It's hard sometimes to, to say that your addition or your use of fund balance is limited to one revenue source or one line item expenditure when you're having to look at all operations on a whole for a fund. Um, I don't sort of know it off the top of my head. Uh, what do we budget for sales tax for 24? For 24, 25. Yeah. Rebecca, do you have that figure? Uh, so for right now, in our sales tax, it is budgeted at $45.9 million. So it's budgeted a little bit less than this year. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's really, that's really smart. I'm good. When will Bucky's be in operation? <laughs> um, so the last I heard was that Bucky's was not going to open until June of 2025. That was my thought. Yes. So it will not have much impact or have at most one month's impact in our current budget for next year. That is true. And the thing to remember about Bucky's <clears throat> is that gas sales, sales and use tax are not applicable to that. That's a highway use tax. So where the county would see additional sales tax revenue from a from a Bucky's or any uh, business that is open up is when they're actually selling goods. The good part about Bucky's is yes, gas yes, sales are a sizable portion of their sales, but that's a quote destination store. Mm -hmm. And they sell a lot more than just gas. Yes. So the merchandise that would be in the store that would be applicable to sales tax. Yeah, and the food and everything mm -hmm. else. Yes, That's sir. Correct. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Crawford, I think you're I see that you're up next. I assume that for us to have questions, and do we have questions? She was already. I know that. Yeah, I think we're ready to talk about the ABSS questions. All right. And Rebecca has compiled the questions that have gone back and forth from the boards to Dr. Harrison and staff. Um, we've just simply cut and pasted those into a two-page document. Um, so we do have answers to. I think all of the questions that were asked, they have uh, graciously agreed to join us today to answer additional questions as we move forward with the budget. All right. Ms. Graves or Dr. Harrison, which would prefer um, being in the hot spot? <laughs> I mean, I don't mind being in the hot spot, but the people who know the answers are Greg Cook 
and Ronda Johnson. So I will come up here and Thanks, find sir. what I can to bring them with me because we need to speak in the microphone, I'm assuming. Yes, sir. Correct. Yeah. And hot spot was a, a term no, inadvisably used. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry, I didn't. I said that the term hotspot was not one I should have used. <laughs> been there before. <laughs> Can't say that I enjoy it, but I've been there before. And I keep coming back. What's that tell you about me? And with the same school system. That's right, yeah. Which is a good thing. Well, I hope so. <laughs> So we do have their responses. I don't know if there are additional questions that you'd like to pose to them or if there are follow-ups to what they've submitted. We, we, yeah, we'll be happy to offer any clarification or, or anything else. And we, uh, for some reason, Miss York and I have had a hard time <laughs> emailing back and forth. We that, have uh, a heck of a time to She, she gets about 50% of the emails I send her. They got and, lost. I'm sorry I didn't catch that. What? Well, we just had, it, it, she sent the questions that I think Mr. Turner had. I replied to about four of them and said, I'll get back with the others. And I think I sent a series of three emails. Then in the fourth one, I said, I think this is all the information. And she replied back and said, this is the only one I've gotten. And so we sent them again. I sent them to Tory and to uh, Ms. York, Ms. Frank, I'm sorry. And uh, so we think we finally got them, got them to you. Sorry it took so long. Yeah. We need to invest more money in our technology is what it is. <laughs> yeah. You also Here's answered an my the questions <laughs> I had. That's right. You had a, you had a separate set. Yeah. Mr. Turner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Harrison, this may be a uh, Mr. Hook question, but uh, we talked last time about the technology part of your request. It was about 1.6, I think. No, 1.4. 1.4. What for me? And we talked about that, that many of those requests really could be considered capital. Yes. Um, we we had done some looking, and I, and I wonder just your opinion about if we took the 1.4 request out of your operations budget, but put it into a revenue stream that came through the, our, our Davenport plan, and sort of came into a, a technology capital I don't know, line item that was that we could use for this year and that was sustainable year over year that you could use and anticipate, would that be something that could work in your mind? Yes, I, th I think that's very appropriate. Last time I was here, I mentioned that uh, other counties lump their technology over into capital, and I think that would be a good direction for us to go. I mean, it may be something that year over year you could, you could sort of gauge whether you wanted to go to technology capital or true capital improvement projects. You could... I mean, if it's coming from the same source, you could sort of divert it one way or the other. Because because the, the dollar amounts are, are there reoccurring based upon the payments that are being made. I'm sorry, the revenue coming in, the payments are being made for debt service. <coughs> um, yes, I, I, I think that would work um, just for the foreseeable future. I mentioned last time 415000 of of the 1.4 this year would be to replace 25% of our student Chromebooks, our student devices, mm -hmm. in a lease program. Uh, and next year, that would increase uh, by another 415, and then the next year another, and then another to put us at a steady state uh, of rough, roughly 1.6, and that would be an ongoing lease. Um, I mean, I think the only place that that could be adjusted could be in year five if we were to have improvements in in the student device technologies, so that we felt they were more durable. But it. Uh, our, you know, our current view is once we use a Chromebook for four years, it, it needs to go out of the school. Uh, you mentioned Chromebooks. If, if I sort of cross-reference that Chromebooks request into the virtual school answer you guys gave, talking about Chromebooks in 2026, <coughs> I, I assume that, that the Chromebooks for the virtual school is not a request in the current budget for the virtual school. Is that, is that right? Uh, when when I speak about Chromebooks, I'm speaking holistically across all the schools. So I don't know. I know we have hotspots and other yeah. technology kind of pulled out for the virtual school. But when when I look at that 415 number, I'm I'm speaking across the entire district, which would include the virtual school. So I'm just looking at the Chromebooks 2026 replace the virtual school. But if we did this and it was year over year recurring, that would that would pull that. I out think of so. Person. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. I think the virtual school requests are included in this and. I have a chart that I sent out to the board as part of those questions. Bruce, I just emailed that to you. It's a PDF. Uh, I don't know if you could pull this up, but it 
has the list of all of those technology um, requests, and then we separated out those that would qualify for the capital item. It's the last question on that document. It's the last question. Yeah, on that um, Adobe document. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, no, I, I've got. Just emailed to just now? Yes, just a minute okay. ago. So it looks like the technology request that Mr. Hook had separated out was approximately 1.638. And when we kind of filtered those for those one time capital expenditures that would meet our threshold of 500000 or more, um, it looks like our total comes up to about 1.388. And I can show you on that chart which pieces would work if we create this technology equipment fund. I'm sorry I didn't have that one. Yeah, that's the document. So, so if we did this, you'd get 1.4 out of your 1.6 request if it was come from a different source. Yes. Um, the, um, you, right. you, mentioned you could use your capital reserve funds for schools. Right, and with the, the the last presentation, we saw that another 325 was going into the capital reserves, which would not eliminate all their capital reserves for next year. They would have that plus, I guess, Very what, the one point, I thought I saw a 1.7 number. 1.7, but there's a budgeted 1.5 for fiscal year 24-25. 1.5, so it'd be 100,000 plus 325 plus the, what, the 50 that's in there now, which would be, you know, 425 or so for capital reserves for next year as well, in addition to the bond loans for capital. Okay. Uh, I want to clarify on this slide yeah. uh, that the 1.6 was throwing me at the very bottom uh, is the total. Uh, but I pulled that back to the very top, and then I'm showing a line item where the state normally gives us $250,000 towards uh, oh, towards this budget. So that would push it down to the, the 1.388, which I when I'm saying 1.4, that's what so that be, is. it'd be fully funded. Yeah, so yes. Now, that's exclusive of numbers you have for the virtual school other than... Chromebooks. Plus, you'd have about 450 in capital reserves for next year as well. Yes. Um, the the preventative maintenance contracts that we talked about last time. I think it was 550 for HVAC and the 150 for for roof preventative maintenance. Have you have you looked at those numbers again to see if I, I have? Um, and uh, so um, for for roof preventative maintenance in, in the original. Um, Suggested number of seven hundred thousand dollars for preventative maintenance, which was part of the one point four increase to maintenance um, of the seven hundred thousand for preventative maintenance. Uh, about one hundred fifty thousand of that is for roof preventative maintenance, which would include twice a year um, preventative maintenance on our roofs at all of our school sites. The other five hundred and fifty thousand was uh, di directed towards. Uh, um, a suggested uh, preventative maintenance program for all of our HVAC equipment. Um, that $550,000 number included um, um, preventive maintenance for all our boilers and all of our chillers, for all of what we call our DX units and our package units and virtually every everything that you would think of as HVAC equipment, everything with a coil. Um, so in the, in the $550,000 figure, uh, there were things in there like uh, cleaning the coils, which would help uh, you know, improve or give us optimal thermal transfer, make things operate optimally. And when things operate optimally, they're more likely to last longer. So it's not struggling. The, the device is not struggling. Uh, but when we go back and revisit it, I can get it down to roughly $345,000. That takes out some of the quarterly service on lots of those package units and DX units. And when I say that, I mean the kind of units that you see around schools or on rooftops that would look similar to what you have in your backyard that's exclusive of boilers and chillers. So we're able to, we could, we could take some of that stuff out to get to get the price down. I'm really interested in the preventive maintenance because we've never we've never done preventive maintenance program. I mean, we our guys, when they go out to, to work on a machine, if they see some things, they'll go ahead and do some PM work while they're there. But uh, if the machine's not in trouble and it's operating fine, they're not gonna do preventive maintenance and that could go on for years. So I think it is important it to have. That makes sense too. If we can I mean, if you think you can still accomplish the mission with a preventative maintenance for HVAC, it's a little less Cadillac than the previous request. I think it's a great place to start. Okay. Um, now you've got you've got some people who are currently on your are being paid. Well, it's in your budget to pay people to do some of that service for HVAC. Well, we have um, seven 
uh, seven total HVAC positions, uh, four of which are, are filled, so we have three vacancies. They've been posted for ever since I've been here with, with no, uh, um, no applicants. If you, <coughs> is this preventative maintenance, take, what, could it take the place of those three people? Yes, I, I, I think um, it's a good place to go. <coughs> I mean, what we would do if we could find qualified applicants would be preventative maintenance uh, and better upkeep I mean, we're able to, right now running around and at a hectic pace to to do repairs the piece that we're not doing is is uh, the preventive maintenance um so uh, you know I, the the problem is in this market with state salaries we're not able to match in the private industry and i've mentioned here before when they did away with the lifetime health insurance benefit that that curtailed our draw uh, to be able to, to recruit uh, folks into these positions okay all right, we'll look at that maybe. There's some potential savings, I think. Um, I had another question, I think it's probably related to Ms. Johnson. Um, the is it 750 or 755 for the 3% increase to match, to keep the supplement at the same level? 750, 755. Um, with the salary increase, is that the one you're doing? We went with the 3% because of the biennial. Um, budget that the yeah. state did last year and it would only impact the supplements paid out of local dollars our goal is to make sure that all of our teachers are in our state allotted teaching positions with the cuts that we've made that number is what's that number um let me pull the presentation back i think it's so it's either seven yeah, it was seven hundred fifty five thousand eighty two dollars i think we talked last time that that assumes that you're fully staffed at the teacher level i mean there's been some you haven't been fully staffed for, for a number of years. Uh, I, I'm wondering if there is, certainly we want you to hire as many teachers as you can, mm -hmm. but I think it's probably realistic that, that you won't be fully staffed. And is there some number that we can save by not paying ABSS additional supplement for teachers that you're not gonna hire? Mm -hmm. Well, our goal, hopefully with all these cuts, is to definitely hire all positions. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, and I and this is also for any certified folks that are getting supplements. Those that's where that comes from. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the last two years for supplements, um, we've had to go into before that even into fund balance just to be able to cover that um, because because of the overspending with the allotments. But this year we've cut a lot of positions. We've saved people, but we cut positions to be able to not have to do that, continue to work towards that. And the supplements do come from fun too. Are you able to, I mean, it looks like you've been about 80 folks, never been better than 80 folks down over the past four or three or four years. If, if you could not hire, if you didn't hire 40, 40 of those people, so you hired everybody but 40, mm -hmm. is there a number that you can, demonstrate would be the savings on not having to pay additional supplement. I would have to get that for you because it depends on their salary. So it'd be who who is it hired? This is something we do in the county all the time. Yeah. We, uh, and we, we can get back with you to use the average teacher salary. Yeah. And say we have 40 vacancies at the average teacher salary. Yeah. What that would, would say. I don't think these are huge numbers, but uh, maybe some, some numbers. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll get that for you. I'll, I'll email it to Ms. York. I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that. <laughs> Did we land on a preventative maintenance contract amount? I think it was three set three forty five. Three forty five plus one fifty. Yes. Okay. So back to the technology equipment. It looks like we would need approximately one point one three eight because I'd forgotten to account for the two hundred fifty thousand that are getting from the state. So that number is would be a little different than what I showed. Up or down? Down. I'm showing one point three there so if i back out 250 i'm at 1138 i backed out the 250 from the 1638 to get to the 1388 darn greg yeah. <laughs> okay so we're still at the 13 okay um let's try and can i just tag on to something um craig and greg are talking about um, when you're talking about maintenance and I heard you go from a certain amount then you're talking about not the Cadillac but go down to another amount I, I would just like to say that maintenance has got us in a lot of trouble over the years 
mold and everything else. And um, I just hope that we will put that as a high priority to really have that looked after. So you're not in this position again, and all of us aren't, because um, we don't do our health that way, and we need to make sure we take good care of ourselves. And um, and just the fact that our buildings just need to really be looked after as though they are our homes. So we are never in this kind of position again to where we're always playing catch up. That's all. I, it seems like the school system's always having to do everything on sale. You know, over the years, it's like we're kind of, you know, cheaper paint, cheaper this, cheaper that. And I understand it. But uh, maintenance is probably one of the hottest topics we've had, especially this last year with mold. I just want us to have the best up on those roofs and walk in those halls to make sure that we are never in a crisis situation again. That's all. Get the Cadillac or the Lexus, you know, just really get the best people to do the right thing. You always want the right people to do the right thing. That's all. Mr. Turner, do you have a just one just one more additional line? Uh, when when I'm looking at the virtual school costs, I, I, I calculate what's here. It looks like two hundred six eight, but then there's the the allotment for the virtual schools for block classes, and so I guess I'm wondering. We've been given twenty three. I'm sorry, two hundred thirty three thousand. I guess I'm wondering is the difference between two hundred six and five hundred this block class or is there is there additional savings here which one are you looking at um, is that on the questions yeah these are questions i don't know if you guys have this additional costs for abss for the virtual school what when i add what's there i come up with 206 800 right because we took out um those computers because they're not we would not need them until 2026 but we still have to pay. There are two people that are not um, included in the state allotments, yeah. and those that's the admin assistant as well as the online coordinator who monitors all the classes that are done there. We then would need to... Um, is that the staff outside allotment of 86,000? Correct. I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is I'm, I'm adding what's here, and I'm not coming up with 500, and I'm wondering if that... No, that 500 there. went down when we knew we did not have to... Oh, uh, okay. So right. that, number changes. that number changed because of that. We didn't redo a presentation to come in, but because we took out those computers from 2026, you would take that out. So, so we would still have to have software. We have to have software to lock down their computers for testing and those types of things. So there's still okay. software, things they need. Um, we provide document cameras for the teachers so when they burn out or whatever, we have to replace those. Um, the kids do have to come in and test, um, so we have to pay those drivers to go all over the county and bring them in to test it because when they're taking the state assessments, they have to take them in the school. Okay. Um, so, so do we have what that new number is? What's, what's that new number? Um, I mean, I added it and got 206800 but I, I, don't I think that was about the correct one. Let me, um, I had it in my email. Hold on. We would just need to add up those. Uh, it was. It would be that those numbers. We would just need to add up the ten thousand eight hundred a year we spent on hotspots. We wouldn't need the computers. We would need the eighty six thousand. And I'm sorry, my calculator's back there next to Jenny, so I'm not a mathematician in my head. Trust me. But those are the numbers, Mr. Turner. Added up. That's what I added. Yeah. Up. yeah. So then that's that that's what we would need. Okay. Because we don't need the computers. Okay until 2026 and I think the last thing I had was for mr. hook and it's the uh, thank you Mr. Mr. the uh, the utilities um, I think it's a, a three point I'm sorry a, a 2.8 million dollar increase plus a 1.2 million dollar contingency I think that's right my uh, my question is if we can really get get good numbers on what we I mean, we got to cover the utility costs. I mean, yes, obviously, we've got to cover it. Knowing what that's going to be, feeling good about that number, getting rid of the contingency. I know that's going to be that's going to be painful that idea. But if, if we got rid of the contingency, but we also had we also all felt comfortable about what it is the actual estimate was for the increases in HVAC, I mean, increases in utilities, and uh, we had 
information going back and forth every month about what the actuals are so that we're able to not only know what exactly we're paying but we can anticipate what, what's going forth in the year and there's an understanding that if you're if you're over if you're going over and need additional funds for utilities come back to the commissioners with a budget uh, amendment request and that we make that whole does, does it under those circumstances does it does it pain you terribly to get rid of the 1.2 million dollar contingency for utilities uh, no it doesn't um, and I, these are some revised numbers um, so I think the numbers you're referencing are re relative to the presentation I did yes. last time and I want to clarify that um, I brought these as a printout for you all too um, but um, uh, the numbers I presented last time were the numbers that I presented to the Board of Education and I had calculated those back in mid and late March so since then we've gotten some bills in so I can have a more accurate view, or at least what I feel is a more accurate view. So these numbers that uh, uh, Mr. Walker has up here uh, in this file, I sent him some files in case, just in case it came up. Um, so to the far right-hand side are the same numbers. Uh, Bruce, what you have highlighted are the budget numbers from the prior year. That was what was budgeted and what, what uh, the county thought it was going to spend. These are, these are the numbers. Would you all like me to... Give you a paper copy. I don't know that I. Thank you. Looks like I'm back at the bank with these. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Let's do it. Thank you. Um, so, um, Bruce, can you click on that little button at the top to enable to kind of get that clear, cleared off the screen? Um, so, uh, what I've done here, and uh, if you want to see an, what an exact bill looks like, like for Duke, uh, Duke Energy, um, I've sent uh, Bruce some of those for one month. Um, th there's a lot of information in them, so I tried to pull it pull it all into this to this document even though this looks like a lot of information I tried to list all the utilities that that we pay for here um, so uh, just uh, if, if you want me to explain a little bit about what th this is high level for me I okay mean, for, to me it was the first request was four million of that was 1.2 mm -hmm. and a contingency so the increase was 2.8 right so right so what, I, what I've done here uh, the 5.8 number uh, that you see there that's that's every utility that we pay for I have a couple of forecasted numbers in there for bills we have yet to receive um, for, for the summer um, but when you look at the 5.8 number uh, and then you subtract out uh, last year's 3.249 budget and that was the budget that, that Bruce had highlighted a few minutes ago on the far left side for water gas and electric uh, that leaves leaves what I'm calling an estimated shortfall of 2552 uh, so from that 2552 uh, then I'm calculating a 20% and 10% contingency number just based off of the full 5.8 and then adding that back to the 2552 to show what the number would be if you were to give a 10% contingency or a 20% contingency. And so now those numbers are either 3.7 at the high side of 3 point, uh, with a 20% contingency or down to a 3.113, which does get us lower. Um, but the, the, the one thing that... Uh, that I keep thinking about whenever I look at these invoices um, is we, we weren't running the air condition last year in June and July like we'll be running it this year in June and July and August to a great degree and then the other piece we had a mild winter so I think that shows in the in the gas costs so um, you know just to kind of elaborate out of the shortfall that that you have there of the 2552 um, 2.374 million was electric shortfall, just Duke. Um, and so from uh, the prior year, the 2.110 budget number to what, what we actually will spend, it's about a 112% increase on, on energy. But I mean, that really makes sense. We're running it on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday throughout the summer, and we're running it through the night. It's more than double right there, just on the number of hours uh, that you're running it. Um, the, the other parts of the shortage, 
only $153,872 of the shortage was gas, whether it was natural gas or propane from any of those vendors that we use, and $24,799 was water. And I, I'm reflecting back to what uh, Ms. Rollins said in our last meeting from ACC, they were seeing their water and sewer rates go up from the new municipality, so that, that makes sense. If you did the math, I think that's probably, probably pretty accurate there. So the bottom line is the from 2.8 to 2.55 is about a two hundred fifty thousand dollar change. Yes, that's about right. And I do have an example if you wanted to see the difference in what we were paying in June last year for Duke Energy to what we paid in October, I could show you that as well. That makes sense to me. Okay, thank you. I don't anything else. I'd like to see it, but I, I'm a numbers. Okay. Uh, Bruce, in the attachments that I sent, if you could open up the folder. And you said the number was two? What's your term? Two, five, five, okay? Two, five, five, two increase. Gotcha. That's what I suppose it's two, eight. Right. Um, in, the, in that folder, um, the one that says, oh, I can see it now. Um, Duke and uh, there's one that says Duke. Yeah, that one. So the reason I have all these different folders is uh, we receive some uh, invoices electronically, some in mail. We pay some electronically, some by check, and some by what we call a P card. Uh, so we've got all these different files here. Uh, but if you just focus on the, the far left of this document that, uh, that Bruce has here, that's, that's good. So if you, um, you're on the Duke Energy bill, so if, yeah, that's right. So if you look, what we spent last year in July, 220000 That's all our Duke Energy bills. And then you look at August, and then you look at September, and then you look at October. We weren't running the HVAC around the clock in July and August, and that's when we started near the end of August, making sure we we're running it. And you can see our highest month was October. Is at that 4 2023 or 2024? This is last October, right. just this this past uh, 2023. So I just all these documents are for the current year that's ending uh, at the end of this month. So you can see the magnitude of the increase just from, let's just say from July uh, to that October. That's where the money's going. You were running dehumidifiers like crazy mm -hmm. um, at a high energy cost. So why does that not equate to the increased cost now? I think it's, it could be a, a small part of it, but the, the, the amount of electricity that, that the chillers and all of the HVAC equipment is pulling is, is a lot more. That the, uh, not to uh, diminish uh, what the dehumidifiers were doing, but they're running on 110 versus um, you know, quite a, a bit more electricity to run, to run the chillers. So I, I think that's uh, a lot more. So I, I will say, uh, you know, we ran those de dehumidifiers a lot more than we're running now. We're running about 300 now. Um, so last year, uh, from September through October, November, into November, we were running lots of dehumidifiers. This year we're running probably 25% to 33% uh, uh, of that number, but we're running them um, May through October. So to me, that would be just a wash, the number we're running now versus then, but the number of months, I, th I think that would just take it out. It's still gonna go up. Mr. Turner, will you? Oh, good, thank you. Did you have a number that you wanted number, number. for utilities? I mean, I see, unless we have any other information that would suggest 2.552996 is wrong, then you're comfortable with that without contingency? I, I mean, I don't want Just to lock checking. myself into the into <laughs> stone on this, but I mean, I, I don't have any other reason to think that that's not accurate. Okay. I mean, if somebody can check We're just it. trying to keep a running tally so we can make uh, sure okay. we know where we're headed. Okay. Ms. Thompson. I know I just saw on the news or someone was talking about um, everybody's 
electricity bill was going to be increased 25%. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that part of this too? Because we're all going to get it. I didn't forecast. I've heard the number 17%. Um, and then I know Ms. Rollins last time suggested she had heard 12 to 15%, I think is the number she threw out when she was speaking for ACC at our last meeting. Um, I mean, 10% alone is yeah. a, a good chunk when you look at the total total value of what we spend, that that would be contingency. I, th I think my opinion is no matter what, uh, without the contingencies, I'll be back up here, mm -hmm. but I'm like I told Mr. Turner, I'm fine to come back. Yeah. Which I think as long as everybody understands that up front, uh, and that we were getting bills monthly so that everybody understands mm -hmm. what the trajectory is. I, I, I'd be curious to know along those lines, I mean, if we end up in the situation, if we're doing a budget amendment during the year, are we going to have to do a BOE and a BOC, a, a board resolution, or is this, uh, is the way paved for, for that just to occur? We could do I mean, we'll be looking at the same thing with the county. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I don't know if that's a resolution. Yeah, you would have to come back before us and ask for the increase. Yeah, it would be a formal request that you would bring on behalf of the board that Okay. It doesn't have to be a proclamation, but it would have to go through before both bodies. Okay. Ms. Turner. I'm stopped. I am not Ms. Turner. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You just gave him a heart attack. It's a it's a different Craig. Different Craig. <laughs> no, I'm go, I just Craig. Go yeah, ahead. Go Craig. Um no, I just I just want to make sure that what we're saying is if they come back in here and the bottom falls out with Duke Energy because they're known to do right. that. Um, electric cars and everything else, looking at the grid, I just want to make sure they don't use candlelight at Beaver Jordan. <laughs> That's all. We're in some real tough times when it comes to everybody's taking a hit everywhere. So, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> My turn? I didn't say anything. It <laughs> okay. is your turn. <laughs> well, what I can tell you is uh, commodities is I know a little bit about that. Uh, Duke Energy, I spoke to my friends in uh, Charlotte, 7.9% increase in your electricity rates. Now, you hit on something that makes a big difference, and a lot of people don't look at it. And uh, our municipalities, Burlington's the worst, raising them up again, and Elon, 10%. Again, 10% on top. Of 10%. 5%. Beg your pardon? 5%. Okay, you know something I don't. That's in the manager's budget. Okay, 5%. Actually, the budget. Just to let you know, uh, 7.9, and we'll take your 5%, although um, natural gas is only going to go up 3.5. So that's about roughly 10% increase. So your 10% contingency is probably where you're going to land after all said and done. Would you agree? 10 percent. Based on my numbers, I, I think it would be a safe place to go. Okay. I think. Um, That's all we here. I think the check accurate. And uh, Thomas, we'll talk later about the five percent. <laughs> um, that's really all I have on this one. I, I have a couple questions for Ms. Johnson. All right, go ahead and ask. Okay. Um, make sure I have the right question. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm not certain if you have this number, but can you tell me how much the uh, how much the school system pays? What, what did you pay last year for teacher supplement? Like the total amount that was paid for teacher supplement? I would have to pull that for you. I, I didn't bring that. that ready today, but I can get the report and send it to Heidi. Yeah, no worries. That's, I'd just like to see what that looks like. Um, because it was um, Commissioner Turner had brought up some things about uh, teacher supplement, and I thought that maybe um, could focus in on that, get a, get a get a better idea. But you know, Commissioner Turner, you know, you're talking about 41 people for teacher supplement. Uh, my average salary for a teacher, I just used a basic number to make math easy, was like 50,000. I know that's on the low side, but if you're looking for 50. I mean, if you, at, the, at the bottom of the pay scale, you're looking at maybe $5,500 a year for teacher supplement, and multiply that by 41, it gets you about a quarter million dollars, 225. I was looking at that last time. Mm -hmm. 
That's it. Mr. Carter. Well, I, do, I do have a question about the teacher, about your staffing situation. Um, looking at the numbers for 22-23 and 23-24, they're reported to DPI, NCDPI, on the first and the 40th day. Is that correct? Yes. And those numbers appear to have doubled between the first and the 40th day, both in almost doubled in 22-23, and a little slightly less than doubled in 23-24. How does that balance out through the year? Or do you fill those positions going into the, through the balance of the year, or is it? Are you staying shorthanded? We're, we're staying. We're staying shorthanded. I think many of those positions, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Johnson, are filled by substitutes. Mm -hmm. So they're vacant positions. So we're paying somebody something. It doesn't cost the supplement. Um, but teacher attrition is huge. Uh, they're not coming out of schools of education. Um, it's it's difficult to staff. So when you're paying a teacher a, sub, a, a, a uh, substitute, are you pay, you're paying from state funding for, for a, a needed position? For a while, we have a lump sum that they give us for substitutes, but at some point we have to kick into to local because it, it doesn't cover what we use. So, and we don't pay supplements to those. Substitutes, unless they sign on as a nope. No, we do not pay supplements to them. And we do have s s classes that we have a um, a long term sub in there for the entire year. So the substitute certified teachers retired or so, well retired. Um, they can only do limited time, um, but many of them are not certified. And sometimes we pay a teacher um, will give up their planning and teach that class for the year so they take on the additional class. We'll do that at our high schools and our middle schools. Mm -hmm. So at some point you have, it's, there's some number of substitutes where it costs ABSS to fill them. Yes. Do you know what that number is? No. And when I asked how, um, I asked our human resource director to reach out to principals last week and just see how many vacancies we have, and he, he came back with 18, nine regular ed and nine. So what I view that as, I probably need more information from the principals, that I know we have more classes than 18 filled with subs. But that must be, that 18 figure must be where we have no one in there and are covering some other way. So what do you do with a class without a teacher then? We, we folks double up. You, you hear one of the reasons we're losing teachers is they have to give up their planning period. They've got to give up time. We've um, taken classes and divided the children among other teachers. Um, our principals are pretty resourceful. Um, certainly not ideal, not what we want to do, but we have to have teachers in front of our children. Right. Yeah. Is there any reason why the state doesn't give you the money to, to provide a classroom with a teacher? And you're going to have to do it anyway. Well, no, I, don't, I mean, uh, we, can't, we can't fill when we talk about these vacancies at the beginning of the year, we have state money for those positions. Now, if we don't fill that position, then we're responsible for the sub out of, out of substitute. They, most of the funding comes out of a formula that's per pupil basis. How many kids you have, you get so much for this, so much for that. Teachers, they pay us the actual salary. So you mentioned if we have a 10-year veteran, I think it's $49,000. So if put Mr. Lashley in there, he has 10 years experience, we'll get $49,000 to give to Mr. Lashley. We put Mr. Paisley in there, he's a first year teacher, we'll get $39,000 from the state to pay Mr. Paisley. If we don't have anybody in there, then they don't give us anything. I've known him for a long time, he's gonna tell you. He's I, was being, I, was, I was being kind. <laughs> you guys have been nice so far, so I can be nice too. Well, you have a number of teachers that are not certified, correct? We do. And are they paid, does the state pay for those? No, the state will pay 
they, they won't pay the state, the, the state rate. Right. They so if we, have, if we have someone on a provisional, provisional license, um, as long as they're making progress, the state will pay them for a year and up to three years, but they have to be working on that. So let's say we have someone we hired that's uh, on a provisional license. We will put them on the state salary schedule. The state will pay them. But then we get to November or December and find out they haven't started the process or they haven't done what they're supposed to be doing. Then all of a sudden the state pulls back and it becomes an audit exception and we're responsible. And, and then and, we the county pay them. And we the county pay them. And Can we've worked really hard to clean that up. That, uh, and Can that's, you get us a number on that? Yeah, that'd be nice. So we actually just cleaned that up for this year and so we are down to we still have until the end of the month we're down to two audit exceptions um, for this year for people that did not follow through um, and I hope we can get those cleared up this week you said two? we're down to two that we're having to pay for out locally because and they you, failed you, to do that how did you start with uh, we started with 80 some exceptions so but now we're down to two so we've been working hard what does it take to get them to Move. <laughs> well, we were able to move some folks when they haven't, the state allows you, when they haven't done their due diligence, we can move them into another source of funding pay. So for some of these folks, they were on a provisional, they left in October, November, so we can't really do anything with them, but the state's going to make us pay for the time they were up to November. We can move them into another state source of funding um, since they're gone to be able to cover that piece of it. For the ones that we've really been working with over the last month, for some of them it's just taking our beginning teacher coordinators, sitting them down, helping them walk through the process. Our HR department has done the same thing. For a lot of people, like I, I had to renew my license. It's tedious when you go into the system. It's not just click, yes, I want to renew. You have to do several things and then you got to pay the state. So for some people, learning how to navigate that, especially if you're on a provisional license, license can be hectic. So we've been sitting with them and doing that. And then with Dr. Harrison, we proposed a plan for next year that we can get ahead of this so that we don't have all the exceptions. And you have a lot of CLEs and all, all kinds of additional requirements. Say, say that. Continuing legal. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. I guess not continuing legal. But no. <laughs> yes, educational yeah. requirements. Now you got me not knowing what the acting see. I, <laughs> you, got me, you messed me up. <laughs> yeah, they do. Continuing. You also have principals for schools that receive D's and F's. We do. That um, at some point, the state is not giving you the amount of money that those other principals are receiving. Is that correct? The state funding stops for D's and F's. Uh, no. no, no, they don't. They they get um, what, what are they, still, they get bonuses. I've lost track of what the principal so, salary schedules. They used to get money for be, for exceeding and for making making growth. Right. Yeah, but no, they don't. They don't pull a salary back for someone. Well, I thought they did. Some of the materials that we received suggested that that was the case, and that we were locally making up the difference. No. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the questions, Dr. Harrison, uh, as part of the, the cuts you made, you've cut back on APs at some of the schools. Right. Um, are, are those at all schools or pre predominantly middle and high? Um, predominantly middle and high. If if you were to put back APs at Title I middle and high schools, how many APs would those be and what would that be? Did we say six or seven, um, which would be? Yeah, I have the um, we have one additional Title One middle school next year that we didn't have. I think the number is seven. And if we look at um, counting benefits and all, probably average salary, average cost per assistant principal is somewhere around seventy-five thousand dollars. So it was about I, a half million dollars. Uh, because you would add, we have four middle schools that will be Title I and two high schools. So um, six. Yeah. Plus uh, Ray Street is also Title I, so. 
And that's included in the number? Bray Street? That would, that would be the seventh. We have four, two, and then if, Bray Street is six. If, if you put back any type of person, would there be anybody you would want back a four A piece? Probably not. Revilers, not APs would be my priority. Thank you. Board, any other questions? Just for public sake, can you just let everybody know what Title One is? There's so many, you know. Yeah, to to Title One uh, is federal funding that. Uh, comes for schools that have a certain percentage of students on free or reduced lunch. Okay. And I don't know what the threshold is anymore. 60% 60. 60 of the students on free and reduced lunch. What kind of, where are we with that system-wide as far as we more than 50% of our system? Yes. yes. Okay. Does the district get a set amount of Title I money and divide it among the number of Title I schools? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and there's a formula, and, and one of the things right now, and, and I know many of our principals are anxious, but we're adding an additional Title I school next year, so the, the numbers don't go up that we get from the, from the feds. It's a bigger pot, so a bigger number of schools. Bigger number, same, same. same pot. And it's based on their student allotment, so because we have two high schools, the elementary and middle actually decrease a little bit. Hmm. Is the program where the whole school got free lunch? C it was like C. C. Yeah. yeah, is that still that's still going on? We're actually going up next year. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, um, looking at the at the report on performance of the schools, we had for one short of kind of tripping uh, the number for uh, DNF school. What is the process that we try to go through to, to mitigate that problem? I mean, is it, where do you look at, where do you look at the cause? I mean, I know it's multifaceted. It's not just one person, not the principal. It's not five teachers. It's. I think that Ms. Johnson and her team have um, put a <coughs> pretty solid plan in place uh, probably two years ago. And um, we think we our preliminary, preliminary data looks better. Doesn't look good. It looks better. Um, and some of that come, you know, we think the um, school instructional support positions that we've just cut, we think that helped. Um, we look at how our teams work around data and, and how they plan and, and what they use with that. And, and one of the things that I often talk a lot about with, with our people is we, we look at this data and we, we kind of see what those numbers are and then we need to figure out school by school what those numbers mean and, and why those numbers are what they are. And then the most important thing, and sometimes we don't get to that in our discussions, what are we going to do as a result of all this information that we have. And I think Ms. Johnson and, and her team were, were putting, are putting together a pretty good um, a pretty good plan. Actually, she has next week, uh, all of our principals will come in for two days. We'll, we'll do half of them Monday and Tuesday. She'll do half of them Wednesday and Thursday. Provide a little bit of support, about a half a day of support from the um, essential services people. Then they'll break out into teams at their particular schools have Dr. Ms. Johnson and her team helping them, helping support them, guide them along, and they're developing plans, developing specific plans. You know, right now, um, I sat in on a couple of principal evaluation meetings today, and we're looking at two things. We're looking at the teacher working condition survey, and we're looking at, at the, the student outcomes. We, we only have preliminary student outcomes right now, but what those principals have to provide is, you know, what's the plan? How are we going to get better? And, and it was interesting, one of the things that we did back between 14 and 18 was we had our target that this is where we were going to be in, in five years. And our accountability and, and recognizing we want to, I always looked as a superintendent at, at the county. I don't, and, and when I report to the board, I report county. With principals, I look at, at school data. So we want to be at 85% proficient at, um, at the county level. 
so what we know is we have some schools already at 82% proficiency, and we have some schools at 30% proficiency. So what the person, what the school at 30%, they're not going to get from 30 to 85 in, in, in five years. The 82, 83% proficient, if, if they only get to 85, that's not going to help us. So we were able to track, and, and this was beyond my capabilities, but our accountability did a nice job. So what's the expectation for each school? So that 85 that 83% proficient school needed to get to 95% proficient in five years. That 35% school needed to get to 70% in five years. So we had it all figured out because, you know, one of the things that... 70% would be a C, is that correct? <clears throat> yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, you know, I, it, it, what I like to... What, what I've always done is talk in terms of... of continuous improvement for everybody. That if you're making a B, let's turn that B into an A. Mm -hmm. If we're making a D, let's turn that into a C. Then once it becomes a C, turn it into a D, turn it into a B. And, um, you know, we're always looking for the silver bullet that doesn't exist. <coughs> and I had a chance to, to go to Finland when I was at the state level and talked with the, the big guru. And Finland in the last 50 years has gone from the middle of the, st middle of the pack worldwide in PISA scores. Now there are one or two in, in every measure. And you can't compare Finland with the United States because it's so different, but you can compare Finland with Finland. And so how did Finland go from the middle of the pack to the top in 40 years? They stayed the course. And what we do in this country is our course changes with elections. Yeah. Everybody wants to be a, an education governor. Everybody wants to put their stamp on something. And so, so what's happening, we, we change the, um, the accountability model on a regular basis. And, and I can remember back when I was in Hope County and, and we, we were one of the five lowest performing school systems in the state and um, we made great progress, and the state board called me to come up and talk about it. I said, you know, you've got me in a situation, we're changing the rules every year. I said, Mike Krzyzewski couldn't win if he changed the rules every game. Mm -hmm. And Rory Williams could, but Mike Krzyzewski could. <laughs> so we changed, we, we changed courses. And, I, and so that's, um, you know, if we, as a state and a nation, can simply say, this is what we're going to, this is what this is that to which we aspire and stay the course on it, we can get there. But when we change the type of testing, we change, you know, it, it's, it's frustrating. I know it is for you guys, it's frustrating for us that we're in the midst of it. And, and so I think um, the board's gonna hire a superintendent that's gonna come here and stay 10 to 12 years. <laughs> and we're going to have them in a position come September or earlier when the new superintendent takes over, that we're gonna move forward and stay the course, and I think you're gonna see some changes. You know, one of the, th and I, this is probably, and I may have said this when I, I did the initial budget presentation, with all the noise ar around us the past six, seven months, um, and I've been dealing with the noise for two and a half months, but I go out in schools and I see good stuff. I see good teachers teaching, I see good kids, working to learn. And so in spite of everything that's around us, I'm, I'm proud to be affiliated with the, with, with the students and teachers out there and our principals working every day. And, and we, as a central services team and as a board of education, owe those folks the support that they deserve. And we as a community uh, simply need to come together and you know, I, I think back to the vision that was created here in 2013 before me. I, I inherited that vision, and I inherited that strategic plan, but it was something the community coalesced around. And that we were all, and I can remember my presentation to, to your body back in 2015, that the budget that we were presenting was, wasn't the superintendent's budget, this is the budget to do what this community wants. So, uh, Ms. Ellington Graves and I have talked, so the board has talked, that one of the first things that um, we've, want to do when the new superintendent comes in 
is re-engage the community and, and, and spend some time really talking about what this community wants for its children. And then we need to set some targets and set some benchmarks. And what gets measured gets done. And so I think that um, it's a whole lot more than you wanted to hear, but I think we're in a good place right now. I appreciate you guys listening, and I appreciate your questions. There's, there's not been a question that I felt was an unfair gotcha question. I think every question has been a good question. I met with a couple of you individually, and we've had good conversations. And uh, you know, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your consideration and hopefully your support. Define for not just us commissioners, but for everybody out in the audience, both in person and or uh, telecast, stay the course. Define that. Um, I say not by, by staying away from creating this year's new thing to replace last year's new thing, which everybody knows is going to be replaced by next year's new thing. And, you know, we've had, Jim Merrill came here and did great work for six years. Jim left, Dr. Bridges came and did good, great work for three years. But that's not a long time. Then we had an interim, Del Burns came after Randy, Dr. Bridges. Then Dr. Cox came. And then I came for four years. And then Dr. Merrill came, then Dr. Benson came, and then Dr. Merrill came, and then Dr. Butler came, and then now Bill's back. And so you stay in the courses. That's why I said, and I, you know, she's probably mad at me for saying it public, and I told her I want to <laughs> talk to her after this meeting. She's probably going to want to talk to me after this meeting. But I told her how important, and her colleagues, it is to get the right person that's going to come in here and give you six to ten years so or more. what do we as a county, I'm talking about school board, commissioners, uh, parents, everybody, to get, to get one, the best superintendent, and then to keep him, her? Um, I think doing what we've done since I've been here. I mean, I've not met the, I've talked with, so many people. Uh, I mean, I've only been in each of our schools one time in three, in two months, two and a half, three months. And when I was here before, I was in each school once a month. And I've, I've not been out doing what I like to do and what I think is important to do um, because we've been working on the budget and, and also I've been meeting with people and just in, engaging people and hearing what people's expectations are and letting people hear what we're, gonna, what we're doing and, and how we're trying to do it. Yeah, any any organization that has problems, those problems are rooted in uh, lack of communication. And uh, every place where we have have issues, I think we need to. One of the things I shared with the the, the team here when I before I got here was this. Jerry Harvey was a professor at American University, I think, and, and wrote a little parable called the Abilene Paradox. And what he says is that it's not our disagreements that get us in trouble, it's our agreements. When we quietly acquiesce to go along, and he tells a story about his family going to Abilene when nobody wanted to go, but nobody, nobody said how they really felt. I said I wanted to go to Abilene because I thought Craig wanted to go. Craig said I want to go to Abilene because I thought Steve wanted to go. Or Mr. Turner, Mr. Carter, excuse me. And so I think we need to be in a position that we can have an honest dialogue. But, you know, Jim Collins, good to great, 40, 30 years ago, he, he, he talks about having loving critics. So we need to be loving critics of one another. You can, you know, I don't, I am, um, talk way too much. <laughs> I talk more, I talk more just now than like you gave me 15 minutes last week. <laughs> I, I think you hit on something that I know I heard every year when my wife was teaching and as you know, John's wife and my wife are both retired teachers, and every, every within a, a year or two normally, a brand new curriculum would come out. The state would fund it, and all, the, all the expense, and before anybody ever really got a chance to find out how good it worked, it was changed by somebody else. And I think that's, I feel like that's part of what you're alluding to, is staying the course, yeah. getting a curriculum that works, 
and watch them where it's going. And I think that's something we all need to work and lobby our state legislators on, is trying to prevent changing things before we actually get a handle on what they're trying to perform. Another issue I say, I, I'm concerned about is the concern with the, with the transition from students to public schools to charter schools or private schools. And as I understand it, you get the state funding for a student, and then if that student goes to a private or charter school, that money moves over to the private or charter school. Charter school. Charter school, not yes. private schools. Not private schools. Okay. Private, so, private schools, families can now get the, the, the opportunity, opportunity scholarship. Right. Scholarship, yeah. right. Um, so that's not a direct, it's, a, it's an expense because you have to take that money out. Right. But then you don't have that child in the, on, on your, one of your campuses. Right. But you still have to support the campus. Correct. Somehow we've got to fix that DNF situation. Because I, I, I'm 100% confident that's what's driving your numbers into the charter school. Get no argument from me. And let, since you brought that up, let me tell you on a uh, pu public policy issue, I, I believe in choice. I believe parents ha should have choice. I believe public, traditional public schools are the best choice, but I think we need to demonstrate it, just like you're saying. Too. I have real problems with the opportunity scholarships because schools receiving public money don't have to accept all kids. So if, to my mind, schools, not charter schools, now I'm talking about private schools that receive the opportunity scholarships. Some of them can discriminate and still get the public dollars. And, and I think that's a policy issue which, with which I have a problem. If 17 schools that are in trouble today, mm -hmm. uh, our new testing just was completed last week. Right. How soon will you have the new numbers? So we actually are still testing today. Um, some of our kids come back mm -hmm. in who missed last week because we want to make sure that we test 95% or above. Right. So we hope by the end of this week we will have predicted numbers. But remember, the state doesn't finalize anything until October. That was the question. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be October. So we'll have our scores, but there's much more that goes into the accountability model for making up the letter grades. It's not just our EOGs and ESCs. <clears throat> Dr. Harrison, are you going to guarantee us that we'll have uh, four or five less failing schools when you leave here? <laughs> if I'd gotten here in August, I would have guaranteed you. <laughs> Don't answer that question. Uh, we appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate what you guys do. Board, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. You're not going to talk about me before I go, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. You need to stay and make sure. You can see what I'm Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Ms. York, what else do we have? I think we have some additional questions that Rebecca will lead us through or take from the board if there are further questions. So we'll hand it over to Rebecca to close this out. We recommend that we use our final work session this Wednesday to discuss your commissioner adjustments. And so if you have any questions for staff or for the school districts, let us know, please, so we can have those prepared and have the research ready for you to make your final decisions and have that ongoing discussion with each other about the budget. Um, it would also be great if you have any specific departmental questions, if you'd like any department heads to be present on Wednesday to answer questions that you have about their request, we would love for them to be prepared and in the room ready to go for you. So please let us know about those. Um, and then lastly, do you have any adjustments to the budget that you'd like to propose today that we can certainly track on our tracker uh, or do any final calculations? Let me interrupt there. Um, we do have one more work session 
that is on Wednesday at 2 p.m. in the same location. So that'll be our last work session. Uh, and then we have a meeting a week from, well, Monday, it's 17th, uh, in which we will pass a budget. So, uh, board, you have questions, now's your time. <laughs> yeah. I just um, want to make sure that everybody, if we are cutting things or whatever that word is, I hate the word cut, that it's system-wide and I mean county-wide. I don't want one to take a big hit and the other not because they're all important. They all add so much value to the entire county. Um, that's all. I, I saw what Parks and Rec threw one and, you know, I just wish money would fall out of the sky, but it's not going to. But I just want to make sure that this budget is fair to everybody, like we're talking about ball fields. I don't think twice about that when I know other folks, you know, it's all about sacrifice right now. It's just a real tough time. But we just have to make sure our parties are really in line. Mr. Lashley. I don't have any uh, spe specifics. Um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Thompson about the Parks and Recreation. Um, there's a lot of things that the Parks and Recs do that we could not afford to do without yeah. volunteers. Yeah. Um, so I'd definitely like, like to take a look at that, as well as the Sheriff's Park. There's two departments that I'd like to talk to. Um, let's see what we could do. But outside of that, I'll wait till Wednesday. Are there, Are there any questions? Would they be present on Wednesday? Well, I'd like the sheriff to be here Wednesday, if he could. Uh, He's at the beach. Okay. We, we, it's got, that's why Mrs. Porter. <laughs> yep. And that, that's a good man to have. Uh, but, yeah, uh, Jamie Merkel, that'd be good. Because uh, a few questions to, uh, not, not really too much to ask of Jamie, just to um, get her to come in and make her case. I know she can make a good one, and I know that she has a lot of... Mitigating is that the right word for, for lawyers? I know no, she's got a lot of she's got a good story to tell, and I'd like for her to come and tell it because I think the commissioners need to hear uh, how the Parks and Recreation actually they're doing a ball field for us, uh, for example. That's just one ex one great example of how they do, and and their 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 volunteer network is amazing, thousands of hours of volunteers, and if we didn't have that, you wouldn't have the. Um, the Cedar Rock Parks, you wouldn't have some of the things that we have in this county if it wasn't for the volunteers. So I think we should look at that quite seriously and, and, and see if we can do something. So you would like her to come with the, her full request and yeah. ask for additional funding from what's been recommended? Sure. Come, come make a, come make a, a statement and uh, provide, show everyone in Alamance County what the Parks and Recreation is actually getting done for us. That's basically it. I mean, shouldn't have to come in and swing a big bat, so to speak, but I think she's got a great story to tell, and I think a lot of folks need to hear it. I think, I'm trying to interpret what Bill is, uh, Mr. Lashley's saying. Uh, I think he's saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, not come in and ask for more monies, necessarily, but to explain what we're doing as a county for our citizens. Am I correct? You're partially correct. Uh, when you said come in and ask for some more money, why not? Doesn't have to be double her budget, but she's got a good story to tell. And um, I think she's just, that, that's just me personally, because I'm on the Parks yeah. and Recs board. Uh, and I see the good, all the great things that they do, and, and I see their budget time and time again gets, gets whacked. You know, the sheriff, the reason I'd like someone from the sheriff's department to come in is because they have a good story to tell. Commissioner, all of our departments have great Absolutely. stories to tell. Absolutely, but take. But we just want to be careful that we're sure. not going down a road that we tried to turn the curve on with yeah. a new process. I agree. I, like I said, I may be getting over my skis here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Um, I just had a, a few questions. Um, Starting with page 146 of our budget book, which is non-departmental human services, which essentially is nonprofits, um, it's a lot of money here for nonprofits. I'm I'm wondering if 
are these monies that we that we spend that receive matches from state and federal dollars? Yes. So on page 146, you're looking at nonprofits that are receiving home and community care block grant funding. And the county is putting in a match that is required in order for them to receive that revenue source. Okay. And so each of the nonprofits that you're seeing on this page, we're providing the required minimum match. There, there's still some ARPA funds left over, I think, that we have not allocated towards the $10 million revenue replacement or the potential purchase, the, I guess the likely purchase of the diversion center. Could any of those funds be used for these nonprofits? I don't believe we have revenue. Free up county dollars. So all of the funds, unless we looked at savings, but um, the $10 million we have put towards the diversion center. Yeah, yeah taking that out. I mean, but the others it's are like, all like allocated. Like sixty grand or thirty, or you know, there were some there were some positions that we were funding that I think there still may be some funds there left. Assuming there's any funds left above what we've already, we can certainly look into that and see yeah. if we can come up with a projection. I'm just wondering I if there's think any. We we committed every bit. Okay. The diversion center. is definitely committed though. Okay. What there what there uh, a few sal a few folks that we put to, towards salary, put that money towards salaries? Like in DSS, I think. And DSS I think and also a grant writer and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think we've already cleaned all That's, that up during your retreat. Okay, I'm scraping the bear. I, I understand. Um, <laughs> the TDA, well, if you look, look on page 147, these yes, are, okay. no, no, not 147. Well, there are a couple of nonprofits that are different on 147. What are those? So these are either a required match or the board had previously committed ARPA funds that got shifted back mm -hmm. over to the general fund. Okay. Those are two nonprofits, Crossroads and Family Abuse Services, that the board committed to funding over three years, and we're wrapping up our third year, is that right? Or second year? I forget. We're either in our second or third year. Second. Okay. So this will be the second year coming up? I'm sorry. This I don't will be know. the last year. Okay. Up. This will be the third and final year that you see for those two. Um, JCPC is a required state match. Uh, Elements mm -hmm. Rescue Unit is a contribution that, that we make to support operations there. Okay. I, I saw that there was a the things that were cut, one of the things that were cut is a, a peak time ambulance that requires yes. four additional people. Yes, that's on our departmental position request list that we, I know y'all wanted to take a second look at that at the next work session. The reason I didn't fund the, um, we can probably pull that up, but the reason I didn't recommend funding the peak truck, although it's needed, is that we're preparing to bring a conversation before the board at a future meeting to potentially franchise our convalescent transport service. And if the board agrees to do that, so we're allowing private providers to come in and, and take over that service for us, we would be able to shift four of our paramedics who are currently providing that service into a peak truck operation. So there's several moving parts to that. I think we have a potential solution sh if we go down that road. And when we bring back that discussion, I'll help flush that out a little bit more in terms of the trickle down effect of that decision and what that would mean for our operations. Okay. But that's why I didn't fund that because I think we have another way to shift folks around if we decide to franchise that. And service. then we can still get the, the, those same people who are doing convalescence into the peak truck. That's what we're thinking. We've got two ambulances on order. Yes, for current year, and a remount and new ambulance proposed for next fiscal year. Okay. Are we getting to a point where we're going to have to, at some point, fund a, a new crew? Uh, once we're committed to building the future EMS station in Mebane, there would be a large staff increase. You'll see that on this list. It's a uh, paramedic. Uh, 16 FTE positions mm -hmm. that would allow us to move into fully staffing a new 
that um, would actually come online until 25, 26, right? Well, we don't have plans for the station to be funded at the current right. state. Well, where's the page that deals with sales tax revenues? Um, you know, there's a summary, a revenue summary, on um, page 67. It is all up together in a total at this point, but we can certainly get you more detail if that would be I saw, helpful. I just can't find it. I saw a... 67. Uh, 67. Page 67 is a summary of revenues. Yeah, I saw a graph, but okay. It, oh, is it breakout it? sales tax? It Nothing. was in the handout, I think. Handout. Um, that's the questions that we've had ongoing. I right. can have what? to pull that up. Well, well, I, I, don't have, I don't have it before me. What I remember, though, is uh, I think we're predicting a little bit of a dip in sales tax this year to next year. Um, how conservative is that assessment? Are there assumptions that you're making that, um, that, we, could, that we could tweak? How, is there any way that, that, that's, that we could get flat revenue? Is that a dangerous assumption? I just want to talk about this yes, we can generally. Um, so basically it was trying to keep where we thought we were going to be flat Right. Um, with a slight reduction due to um, just what we're seeing trend-wise with revenues coming in. Even budgeting at $45.9 million is still going to be more than what we're anticipated to bring in this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Okay. So budgeting the revenue at forty. Oh, I see. I see. The budget is going to be more than actual. Right. This year. Right. So it's so it's still okay. Yeah. So while it's it's less than budgeted, it's more than actual. It's still trying to okay. project for some growth. What is your graph? Okay. Yeah, on this graph, we're showing the dollar change for all of the sales tax articles right. next year to right. be almost five hundred thousand dollars less, less than right. current year. But that is above actuals for each of those categories, because it's one big pot. You're just splitting it up. Yes. Okay. Medicaid hold harmless. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, we've gotten about $3 million on a Medicaid hold harmless payment. This year, it's going to be closer to $600,000. 600, yes. Is there, is there no way to, to predict that we might have some Medicaid hold harmless payment in next year? So within that $45.9 million is a budget of $500,000 for Medicaid hold harmless funding. So if we were to remove the Medicaid hold harmless funding from the total that you see of there, the 45.9, then we would have 45.4 in true article. You're just not helping me at all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. And that is actually back to the norm um, yeah. of hold harmless right. prior to yes. COVID. So that is most likely what we will see from now on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, page 146, 145. The TDA, so the, these are basically nonprofits who are getting money from the TDA. So that's not county general fund money. That's right. Okay. TDA, Tourism Development Authority. Yep. Um, yeah. uh, just looking at some numbers here that, that are just kind of off of last year, it, it looks like Alamance Arts requested something pretty big but, but didn't receive, got a pretty big cut, just wanted to, Talk about that if Mr. Baker knows anything about that. So this is our occupancy tax yeah. funding. And this year um, we have our municipalities receiving um, occupancy tax. And so we're anticipating that they will make some appropriations to nonprofits as well and that the county was no longer carrying the full load. Brian, do you want to speak to the arts one in particular? That's right. The two that were affected that are inside municipalities are Alamance Arts and the African American Historical Museum. We had conversations with both of those entities before budget started in January or so and said, this is our plan. The cities are getting uh, occupancy tax now as well. You need to approach them because we are you know, planning to, to split the burden with them. And We've taken those funds that we were uh, contributing to the in-town attractions and kind of given a little more to some of the out-of-town attractions that we weren't able to fund before. Those which would not be in municipalities, Correct. which the county would cover by itself. That One thing that relates to that sort of piece, um, right. they made a pretty big request. Their funding is like it was 
last year. I was just wondering for the the, requ the reason for the request, and it looks like there's about one hundred thirty-six thousand dollars that's not appropriated. Is that accurate? That's correct. We have not fully appropriated those funds. Is there any reason not to? Mr. as he just pointed out, the cities themselves are going to receive three percent of the occupancy tax in addition to the three percent right. we receive. And I, I agree with um, with your assessment. The city should be paying that instead of us, the county, be paying that. I agree that with that. The, the one thing though is that the sort of piece is all county. It's not a municipality. I just wondered why not, why not fund a closer to their full request. Studio One's actually in the mall. This is the sort of piece. Yeah, they, they have they studio. run that sort of piece theater down there too. Well, I know they have the theater down there for the presentation, but they have an operation in the in uh, the Holly Hill Mall as well. That's, I think that's where they practice and do a lot of their work. What was their request for, Mr. Becker? Do you know that? 208000 was their request. They were funded at seventy last year, and we have them recommended to be funded at eighty this year. Um, there's certainly room for movement with it, at y'all's discretion, uh, but that was our suggestion. We also funded, again, a couple other things uh, that we hadn't been able to fund, the people that we turned down in years past. Um, but with some of those extra monies, we were able to fund some of those things. But that entity could also draw from the city of Burlington. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Is that not true? They certainly could, yeah. I mean, it's so they Studio One has operations that are in municipalities, and the sort of piece, of course, is outside. So if they wanted to ask for funding from, for their in-town activities, that, that they're eligible for that. The, the other area I wanted to inquire about is is this hard to fill positions. Um, I mean, since I've been here, we've had vacancies that we couldn't fill for detention. We've had vacancies with paramedics. We've had vacancies with DSS, particularly social workers. We funded a, a salary study. We then implemented the salary study to address that, and we talked about being at the market level, which we are. I suggested at that time, and I still believe, that there are three positions within the county that we still cannot fill and that we ought to put extra attention into those to be even above market if we need to be. And those are the tension where we have significant vacancies, paramedics, like I said, and, and DSS, social workers, where we have uh, hard to fill. Uh, we're not doing that with the current plan. I'm not necessarily suggesting that we add revenue to that. I'm wondering if we can find revenue to to give those particular folks uh, a hit above, um, to just take them above market. I think it's time that we spend some, some attention that directs revenue to the places where the county is not currently able to find people to fill the positions. I think that makes sense. I think it's a private sector idea. I know that government sometimes doesn't like to do that, but I think we need to think along those lines. And so I, I would like to look at that between now and, and certainly budget time, budget vote. Which is Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll point out as well, I'm in the conversation earlier today with the sheriff, and I appreciate uh, Chief Fortner being here today, and uh, um, Montrese. Um, Captain, <laughs> Huh? <laughs> My captain that keeps me in line. Right. Um, being here today, but we lost another detention officer this morning. Uh, no, I did not know that. So it's, I mean, it's, praise the Lord, we're not at critical. We're not where some other counties have been recently uh, described as being, but we're getting close. We don't need to let it get any closer than this. Is there some additional amount that you would like to suggest on those three positions? I'm wondering, I'm wondering if in the two thousand to three thousand dollar range, if there's what that does to what that does to the budget. I don't know. I need to look at those numbers. Okay. Any other questions before Wednesday? Not a question, but I just thought I'd recognize a guy I paid for his ride on the elevator last meeting. <laughs> Keith, and I can't think of your last name right Barbara. now. Barbara. Barbara, right. She is with the Times News. He's a new reporter replacing Robbie Nelms. So. Glad you did that. I was kept wondering who. <laughs> <laughs> 
You have big shoes to fill. That's what I've heard. Robbie did a really good job. Yeah. I just want to give a shout out to some people. Um, last Wednesday, I had gotten a call about a 80-some-year-old lady that was homeless on the streets in Burlington. All she had was a suitcase and her walker. Um, she was septic. She was everything, and she was ticked. I believe she could have took all of us, but she was in really bad shape. A gentleman from my church was trying to help her, and I want to give a big shout out to um, Burlington Officer San Diego Lopez, but especially too, I mean, he was on the year on the force one year, but he was a real pro. You wouldn't have known it. But also Maria Holm, Gregory Kim, and their supervisor, Philip Childers, um, they were amazing. This was like a two-hour crisis, and to talk her into going to the hospital out of fear that we were, somebody's going to put her somewhere, and plus she was very septic, so she was really not clear on anything. The patients, all of these first responders showed her, and um, and just everything. And I, um, they they said you need to do a ride along with us. So I'm going to. Y'all hope you I hope y'all don't call 911 when I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, I I don't think you know we we think about certain agencies all the time because we have to. They're always in the spotlight. But I think EMS is probably one of the most taken for granted folks because they always show up like fire, like police, like sheriff, like everybody. We have got to make sure social workers, DSS, the elderly, there is so much need. And for us to have a um, 80-something-year-old grandmother on the streets, you know, that's a real failure. But these folks just did everything for her. And um, she told me she's going to sue me. She said, I'm going to sue you, and I'm going <laughs> to sue them. I'm going to sue them. I said, get in line. <laughs> So, but she was just so mad at her situation, and it was anger and sepsis talking at the same time, but she, they've really got her calmed down and got her some fluids, and they admitted her into the hospital. So I'm just so thankful because we had plans to get her in a motel that night for a couple of days, and she wouldn't have made it. And um, these, these guys, Childers was something, and the t two paramedics, everybody was just on their game. We are a very lucky county to have these folks in the positions that they're in. And we always want to get there as soon as possible, but sometimes we we don't think we need to pay them. <laughs> and we do need to pay them because um, we don't think about their salaries when they're doing CPR on us, you know? We just want them there. So we always need to think about that. And the walks in the parks are healthy. They make a big difference. Everything for our county makes a big, big difference for our citizens. and. Um, we just, like Dr. Harrison said, we just got to really come together and work this out because um, you just never know about tomorrow, and we need to really take care of each other that do all the taking care of. So, um, but I just wanted to call their names to their attention, so I called their supervisors to brag on them, and um, it was it was just something. They're, they're amazing people. And June the 19th is the ribbon cutting for our new behavioral center. Uh, so I'd encourage everyone to attend that. Uh, that's a week from tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. No. Wednesday. It's, it's a week from Wednesday. Right. But uh, yeah, that lady would likely have gone to that behavioral center. No, that wouldn't have worked. That wouldn't have worked. She did a medical, but um, sometimes things just don't turn out the way we hope. Yeah. Let me explain the behavior center. I think I have over and over, but uh, situations like that, you have a choice now of jail or hospital. Primarily, those are the two choices. Uh, once we have the diversion center up and going, uh, then you'll have a third choice. Those individuals could, I'm not necessarily saying this lady, uh, could go to that center, be evaluated, it will have up to 16, will have 16 beds. Uh, it's not a long-term stay situation, but it is a situation they can then assess the individual and determine whether they need immediate medical assistance, as this lady apparently did, or do they need to incarceration or, or something else. Uh, with the 16 beds, if it's a drying out situation, they may not have to go to either in the long term or short term. Uh, but it gives the county one or more option that most counties simply do not have. 
anybody else. We do have the changes that were suggested related to ABSS funding from Commissioner Turner <coughs> during the discussion. If you want to take a peek at those, or we're happy to save those for the next work session. Save, save them? Okay. Okay. We didn't have anything else. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Have a motion, second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.tv tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.